Hi, and welcome to Mother's Quest, a podcast for moms like me ready to live our own truly epic life. I'm Julie Neal, a life and leadership coach, community builder, writer, and mom to two high energy boys who challenge me to grow into my best mom! self. Mom! <laughs> I'll be right there. Where was I? I'm excited to share this beautiful conversation with Tembi Locke that centers around the wisdom of our matriarchs and the seeds they plant within us to pursue our journeys, to create space for resilience, love, and creativity, and to invest in ourselves so we can serve the collective good. Tembi is a distinguished keynote speaker, writer, advocate, and American actor with more than 60 TV and film credits, including the global hit Netflix series, Never Have I Ever. She's also the author of the New York Times bestselling memoir, From Scratch, a Reese's book club pick and soon to be Netflix series starring Zoe Saldana. Before I share more, I'm honored to introduce Temi's sister, acclaimed author and writer and producer of many powerful series for television, including Little Fires Everywhere and When They See Us, Attica Locke. Hi, my name is Attica Locke, and I am honored to dedicate this episode of Mother's Quest podcast to my mother, Shara Aguirre, and to the spirit of all of the ancestors in my matrilineal line, women who mothered as visionaries, guided by love, women who had the capacity to at all times wrap their children in love that I felt through my lifetime even from people on the other side. I am eternally grateful for the way that they have guided my life and made space for me to grow and to create. And in that matrilineal line, I include my sister, Timby Locke, who is on this podcast. She has also been a great visionary of love in my life. Thank you. Thank you, Attica, for this beautiful dedication to your mother, to your matrilineal ancestors, and to your sister, Timby, all who have been, as you say, visionaries of love in your life. The legacy of love and vision is a thread that weaves throughout our conversation as Tembi names and shares about the four generations of women in her family who she can trace back to the time of reconstruction after child slavery and whose lessons help her navigate today's world. We explore how her family's ecosystem enabled her to invest in her dreams, nurture creativity and play, and pursue her creative endeavors and also how she carries that forward and how she mothers her daughter, Zoella. Though we covered a lot of territory together, we realized there was so much more we wanted to discuss, including what it's like to star in her latest hit show, Never Have I Ever. So Tempe has agreed to a special Mother's Quest Q&A via Zoom that we will schedule in September. Make sure to join the Mother's Quest email list or Facebook group for details if you want to join us. I felt like this whole conversation was inspiration to light the way during these pandemic times, those profound moments that filled me with clarity and faith in the future. I hope this conversation helps remind you, as it did me in Tempe, of the power of our matriarchs, of sharing our experiences, of learning from and guiding each other, and seeking that sanctuary within so that we can serve a higher good. I'm Julie Neal, and this is Mother's Quest. Welcome, Tembi, to the Mother's Quest podcast. I am so honored and really excited to hold some space for reflection for you today and to learn from you. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. It's exciting to be able to sit down and talk with you, particularly in the moment that we're all living. And I know people will hear this many different points in the future, but some of what I think we talk about is evergreen and will always resonate. (laughs) Absolutely. I feel like so many of my conversations are, this one's been a long time coming. Seeds for this conversation were planted when I got the chance to meet you in person at a Happy Women Dinner event that Jill Daniel was organizing. I hadn't heard about you or your beautiful book from scratch yet, but the moment I arrived and started to hear you tell your story, it felt like such synchronicity for me that I was there. 
you and I had so much in common. We had, in fact, been in the same program in Florence, Italy, where you met your husband, Sorrow. The book was centered around only one year apart from one another. And immediately, I just felt like a sense of kinship with you and the experience that you had been on. So this conversation feels destined. Thank you for sharing that. The gift of writing from scratch and, well, we can talk about the gifts of writing a book, which Mm. are particularly a memoir, but the gift of sharing from scratch in person with people and also digitally, but definitely in person are moments just like the one you just described, Julie, wherein two people who have never met before meet up at a specific time and space (laughs) and find all of these connective points. And we have words for that, synchronicity, Mm. fate, destiny. But ultimately, I like to think of it as a moment to be open and available Mm. to the kind of grace and surprise that's always around us. I would have never known that you would have been there that day. I think there was someone else that day who I had actually been on the same program with in Florence. So, you know, more than 20 years in the past, We hadn't even seen each other. And sure enough, there she was standing right before me. So I'm always curious about moments like that. I'm happy we met and I'm happy to be here now. Me too. I want to start with the first question, which is hearing from you the impact of your own mother in your life and shaping who you are today. But I wanted to invite you to first bring your ancestors in, in a way. And the reason why it came to me It's because last night I was co-facilitating what's called a Rosh Hodesh circle for my temple community. It's a new moon circle. And because it was the month of May, our focus was intergenerational. So we had mothers and daughters, some sheltering in place in their own homes, some in different rooms or different homes. And we asked everybody to introduce themselves with their matrilineal lineage. So I said, I'm Julie, daughter of Fran, granddaughter of Ruth and Mala. And it was so beautiful. And as I was looking through your book again today, I saw connections that you have with not only your mother, but your grandmother. And I just thought that might be a beautiful way to move into this first question. So if you want to introduce yourself with your matrilineal lineage and then share what the impact has been on you of your mother, but possibly also the other matriarchs in your life. You don't have to ask me twice. I love that Mm -hmm. question. I am Tenby daughter of Shira Johnson Locke Aguirre Sek, granddaughter of Odell Sweats Johnson, great-granddaughter of Fanny Sweats, great-great-granddaughter of Emma Hawthorne Jackson. So I just took you back to the time pre-Reconstruction at the very end of slavery in East Texas. Those, that's where I hail from. That's where all people, both my mother and father's side, hail from. But certainly all the women in my life can be traced back to about a 10-mile radius in a place called Trinity County in East Texas. And I'm very honored to be a descendant of them. The women that I know of, and I know directly, because other than Emma, I knew Fanny who's my great grandmother. And I also knew my grandmother. And obviously I knew my mom and each of them raised me. I am their hopes and dreams Mm -hmm. (laughs) with intentionality, but I am also the love that they seeded in the world. And so one of the things that I really feel, I was raised by an ecosystem of women. My Mm -hmm. mother obviously was the hub of it all, but my mother she was an only child, the only daughter of Odell. And so my grandmother also raised me. I spent summers with her at a time when my mother was rebuilding her life. She was also getting more education. And so, you know, we would be planted with my grandmother for the summer and by extension with my great grandmother, because my grandmother was the caregiver of my great grandmother. So I had at some times, you know, there would be four generations of us under one roof. And so you can't not take in all of who they are, either directly through the things that they share, but also by osmosis, you know, Mm -hmm. and they were very capacious and open women, very willing to lend a hand, active servants in their community and in their small rural community, initially by necessity because of the Jim Crow South, but Mm -hmm. also because of just who they were and their belief system in the world. And my mom 
has all of that. And she taught me that in her own way. That's who I hail from and some of what they taught me. That's beautiful. I'm thinking particularly of this time and space that we're in right now. And you and I were chatting a little bit about just how challenging this global pandemic and all that it is demanding and asking of us. I'm feeling curious in particular, what lessons, if any, you think those four generations seated in you that are helping you navigate this time right now? Well, one of the things that my sister and I were talking about this recently Women, and not just my family, but of the time and of the culture and demographic and geography that they were born into, often had to move forward in life without a specific sense of what would come. I mean, they were very aware of that. You couldn't sort of make plans. In fact, trying to get out of something like chattel slavery You do that only through dreams and hopes, right? And through some sort of practical practicality, some sort of a reliance on community, but a deep sense of faith beyond what can be seen, felt, and touched right Mm -hmm. in front of you. And so I really am calling on that. We were literally talking with my sister about the drinking gourd, which, you know, was not a part of my direct family tradition, but that's for those listeners who don't know what that is. It's funny, I'm talking a lot about this moment of slavery, but simply because you asked for my ancestors and that is my ancestral lineage. But those of us who know about the underground railroad and the way that people move from an enslaved place and state of being into a free state of being without roadmaps, guides sometimes, without a system to do to make that escape, if you will, they did it by following the constellations. And the drinking gourd is effectively the Big Dipper. You travel by night in the darkness and look to the sky for that way north. And so I share that moment. I follow your question up with that share and specifically because right now we are all following a constellation. There is no guide. We're in the darkness. We don't know what's coming next. And yet people have been there before and they've done it and they have moved through. And they have done it because they know that that is what is needed to be done in the moment. It is all that is available to them. And they have an eye not only toward their own individual sense of salvation, but the collective salvation and the salvation of future generations. And so in a pandemic, our individualism has to be put aside for a moment to serve the greater good. You didn't get from an enslaved place to a free place doing that all on your own. There was no lone ranger sort of way. You traveled in a group, the group had to stick together, you had to rely on each other, you had to respect each other, and you had to move forward. So those lessons are the ones that I find myself applying in 2020 Mm -hmm. to how I want to move in the world, how I want to be in the world, the things I'd like to impart to my daughter. And my own matriarchs and family taught me what it means to hold a vision in mind that is greater than anything you can see right now, that will require sacrifice, that will require patience, and follow it. Yeah. And that's what I'm seeking to do in my own personal and individual ways each day. And you have to be nimble. That's the other thing is being nimble because things change day to day. And we're seeing that now and things always have changed day to day, quite frankly. Mm but in a very grand and very heightened way right now. And so we have to be nimble as well. And because something worked yesterday doesn't mean it'll work tomorrow. Mm. Almost every interview, there's some part that is so profound that I know I need to go back and listen to it again and again. I had just chills and tears welling up listening to you share about these lessons of your ancestors and the power of looking to the sky and to something bigger. And I'm also struck by this strange, I don't know, this juxtaposition of needing each other more than ever and needing to act for a sense of the collective good at a time when we're so isolated. I'm really moved by what you shared and thank you. Oh, thank you. And the isolation part is challenging. You know, certainly how are we together when we're apart? (laughs) And I often think about, you know, again, that we look to history and all the historical moments when there have been moments of intense 
separation. And certainly the era that I spoke of earlier was a time of intense separation for families often. And through the ways in which people were sold off one plantation to another, and you would find ways to keep in touch. Mm. And you had to be creative about that if you could. And even if you couldn't reach someone via message, touch, or in person, you would have to do it energetically. You would have to just say, let my love, let my light, let my grace, let my energy surround the person I love most right now. Even though I may not see them, I can't be close to them. And I think many people that became a spiritual practice of trying to connect with people that they were, in some cases, forever separated from. So we don't have to look very far in the history of humanity to find examples of people who have been in situations as harrowing, if not more harrowing, than this moment we're in right now. And sometimes that's helpful even to just keep it in perspective. Yes. Yeah. Keep it in perspective. I want to draw on some of the themes that you have started to share about looking to the sky, the power of lighting the way, the journeys that our ancestors and we have been on to introduce this idea of living an epic life, which has become this grounding framework for me and the anchor for all of these Mother's Quest conversations. And basically, now it's been about four years ago, I had a spiritual experience of my own one day that caused me to choose into living my life a different way. And I didn't have the language for it in the moment, but it became later clear that it was this idea of living an epic life, choosing a life that was filled with all the things that mattered most, where I felt like I was answering that internal call and stepping into the largest expression of who I could be and really fulfilling what I felt like was my purpose. I was very much modeled after the hero or heroine's journey that I had been reading and hearing about. So Epic became metaphorically this way I wanted to live. And also I identified it as an acronym mnemonic that I felt had the guideposts that if I followed those guideposts, I would be living a more Epic life, especially in the years when I'm raising my children. What I'd love to walk you through is, first of all, just hear in what ways, if any, this idea of an epic life resonate or not for you. And then I'm going to ask you about each of the guideposts and how they show up in your life. Oh, thank you. I do resonate with answering a spiritual call, a call for what is seek to be lived within. I couldn't have written the memoir that I wrote without having answered that call. And I definitely believe in the heroine's journey or the hero's journey. In fact, it was a class that I took at UCLA through the writing extension program that was actually on um, memoir and the heroine's journey. And that class became, for me, a kind of framework to understand the way to examine my lived experiences and examine the love and loss that I had experienced and put a narrative framework around it. It gave me, you know, sort of, I come from the world of, you know, acting and theater. And so I understand the three-act structure (laughs) very well. (laughs) I have a guide and teacher in my life who is also in, works with people in my industry of Hollywood. And so I remember when we first met, she told me about, I think the Lord of the Rings, the trilogy was sort of in and out of theaters during that period. And this has a point, what I'm getting to, which is that she talked about within the Lord of the Rings, which is basically the first one is a call to action. The second film is like, okay, we're on the journey. (laughs) And then the third film is like, oh, I got the ring. (laughs) That's the quest. (laughs) It's like the call to answer. Oh, and you know, what's funny is that people were always criticizing the middle film, the second film, because it was like, oh my God, it drags. It's so slow. It's so nothing really happens. And she always points out, it's because you're on the journey. Receiving the call is exciting. It's like, oh my God, I want to do this. I need to do this. I have to do this. Then you start doing it. (laughs) And you have to (laughs) wrestle with, oh my gosh, you know, I'm on this journey. And many of us can relate to that. And of course, when you complete your journey or when you fulfill the journey and you circle back or circle home or fulfill it, then that's its own kind of rewarding feeling. So to answer your question about the quest, right? Yes, I love the idea of being on a quest. 
and the framework of the heroine's journey. So yes, I love to talk about that. I'm curious before we move into the guideposts, was there a spark moment for you when you felt like you truly answered the call? Yes, there have been many times I have answered the call in my life. One of the things I know now is I am a seeker. Mm -hmm. (laughs) More often than not, whether I'm aware of it or not, I'm on some kind of quest. (laughs) (laughs) It sometimes takes a moment to reveal itself to me. Yes. Because I tend to be someone who follows my impulses. I don't make myself beholden to a five-year plan or like in three years, this X has to happen and that kind of thing. I have that loosely sort of hanging out, but I generally follow my heart. And so my heart, one time when I answered the call was when I got the impulse very clearly that it was time to write my story. Mm -hmm. It coincided or not coincided was emerged at the fifth anniversary of my husband's death. And there was something about reaching that moment and realizing that I, God willing, would have five more years and then five more years and then five more years and that my life would continue to grow and expand beyond the moment when we separated physical form. And I wanted to write down what I had learned in those first five years because I knew it might never be as fresh as it was at that moment. I knew it would be a book and I knew I needed to get an agent (laughs) and I knew I needed to submit a proposal And I did those things. And when I got the book deal, there was the feeling of, oh, I have answered this call. And then, of course, I was on another quest because then I had to start writing the book. (laughs) It was was the long, arduous middle movie. (laughs) Exactly. 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 So that's one moment of me. Becoming a mother was one. Falling in love was one. Mm. You know, there have been many moments where, and I think all of us know that. Yes. And I love to note, and I have several episodes about this, that the heroine's journey, that we're really clear that it's a spiral process, that we're going through this process again and again and continuing to bring back the gifts of the treasure, the ring, whatever it is that we've learned and sharing it with our community. I want to say that the seeker in me sees the seeker in you. (laughs) I definitely identify that as well. And what are you most on a quest for now? What spiral ring are you on now? I have to say, if I have to coalesce it all and sort of boil it down into a sentence, it is to use the gifts that I have, the voice I have, the talents that I've been given in this lifetime toward the highest and best good. And often that means getting out of my own way or getting out of any attachment or fixed idea of what that has to look like, Mm -hmm. but simply follow the impulse and be open to whatever that looks like. Mm, Those words are really resonating for me. Well, let's dive into the guideposts. The first one, E, stands for engaged mindfully with our children. What are the biggest lessons that you've learned and maybe ones that you're really having to call upon during this challenging time now about how to engage mindfully with your daughter, Zoella? Yes, I would say the first thing that comes to mind is listening. Here's the thing. Until she was born and came into my life, I had never been a mom before. (laughs) So (laughs) how the heck would I know how to be a mom? (laughs) Yes. And so just like when we have our infant child and we look to them for the cues to what they need, like the physical cues, their face sort of makes a funny face. Oh, do you need your diaper changed? Or, oh, a sound. You need to eat. Or you seem tired. Those things that we're sort of constantly trying to check in with them to see what is needed, right? And those nonverbal cues that eventually as they develop become, they can verbally tell you what they need. But right now, I'm finding that it's kind of a combination of both. I need to listen to the unspoken cues of what might be needed. And also when she does talk, she's 15. And not to say that she's not a talker and an engaged person, but when she really is wanting to ascertain when she's really needing me to listen, not just hear, but really listen actively and speak less. Yes. That's a big one because she's parsing out a lot of her world and trying to make sense of it. And sometimes she's thinking out loud and she needs the rambling space to kind of go left and go right and up and down and then come back. 
And if I get impatient with that, because I'm like, well, what's the, you know, like, what are you getting to? I lose, I lose, I lose the opportunity to see what's there. And also I'm subtly sending a message that she's being shut down in some way. Yeah. So I have to really actively listen right now. And it, I think is developmentally kind of where we all, you know, a 15 year old and a mom would be. But also I think in the time of the pandemic, we have so much time together under one roof that sometimes you're like, well, we're all together all day long. I know what you're doing. You know, like I know you sort of fill in the blank because you think like we're around each other, but there's a lot going on that I don't see or know unless I really actively listen. Yeah. I have two kids, a seven-year-old and a 16-year-old. I'm just taking in the wisdom of this learning and how that shows up differently with each of them. Mm. So appreciating this reminder. I want to ask you about the next guidepost P. It stands for passionate and purposeful. And this is about the impact that we're here to make. You know, what you said you're on a quest for now about, you know, using your gifts and your talents and who you are for the highest good. What would you say has been the biggest lesson you've learned about how to do that? The biggest lesson I have learned in the last year since From Scratch came out and since I became a part of or really said, hey, I want to be a part of the team that adapts this to screen. So I have had the pleasure of learning a whole new skill (laughs) set. Of what it means to be a screenwriter. So in really the last 24 months, but certainly last year of my life, I've done a lot of new things, right? Things I've never done before. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I am well into my professional life and I am learning whole new professions. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) wait, what? (laughs) So the only way to do that really is to ask for help. Yes. And ask for guidance and look to teachers and models of both people who've maybe done multiple things, but also people who are doing what you are seeking to do, who are doing it really well, and who are generous to reach a hand back and share with someone else how they do what they do. That's been the thing that I've learned a lot this year of being really willing and open to ask questions. And again, listening, because I can't know what I don't know. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I just can't know what I don't know but I know I'm willing to listen and find out and be curious and work hard. So I hope that answers the question. It it does. And just connecting back to the theme of the heroine's journey, I think when I said yes to living my epic life, a commitment I had was that when I'm on that dark path or the path that can feel so dark, that I wouldn't do it alone. That Mm -hmm. I knew that there were guides that could help light the way and that I could also help light the way. And that in community, we could do that for one another. I just deeply resonate with that. And I also want to just name, speaking of family connections, that I was doing some research and reading about your amazing sister, who's Mm -hmm. also a writer. Mm -hmm. And I saw that she's one of the guides that it seems that you've pulled in to help you bring the story to the screen. And I just, I have two sisters as well. And one that I've had the opportunity to work closely with recently through Democracy Clothing, which I know you're aware of. That ability to work alongside sisters, whether they're biological or otherwise, is also just such a powerful opportunity. Thank you for pointing that out. Yes, my sister is very much one of my guides in life. (laughs) And just as a person who she is on the planet, but also in terms of her rich and vast, deep, expansive professional life. She is a award-winning novelist. And she's up for like, it feels like three awards right now or two. (laughs) And she's also been a television screenwriter and producer. And she was side by side with me for almost every moment that I write about in the book. So it seemed a natural fit that we would take that journey together to adapt the book to screen her leading the charge as the showrunner and me, you know, bringing my gifts and talents and working side by side with her. And you're right. Sharing that sisterhood, and again, you point out very beautifully, it doesn't have to be biological by any stretch Mm -hmm. of the imagination. You know, I believe in what I call soul tribes. I mean, I'm not the one who coined that term, but I use it intentionally. And you can have a sisterhood with people that you are definitely not biologically related to, but they feel a part of your soul sisterhood. There's a kind of grace and shorthand in that. And I'm very, very aware of how incredibly lucky and blessed I am to be able to do this work with my sister. 
Mm. I have a new question that popped up for me that I think will connect to the next guidepost, which is I invested in yourself. And this guidepost is about creating opportunities for learning, the self-care, the space for joy, and also just making a commitment and an investment to your dreams. What I'm curious about before I hear about the ways in which you invest in yourself, I noticed that, you know, in addition to your sister, I think you posted the other day about your brother, who's also a musician and an artist. And I thought to myself, and this happens often, like, wow, something happened in this family that helped the set of siblings pursue their dreams in really creative, profound ways. So first, I'd love to know, this kind of connects back to your lineage. What do you think it was within your family ecosystem that enabled you and your sister and your brother, and I don't know if you have other siblings too, to invest in your dreams and your creative pursuits in the ways that you have? I love this question and I am still trying to understand fully what happened. <laughs> you know, in How did that happen? I, mean, I have some answers and I will definitely speak to those, but I also leave space for the mystery of it mm. all. On a very practical plane, yes, I have creative siblings who really believe in being able to step into that space, but we didn't get here by ourselves. So one of the things just on a very practical plane that I can say to all parents or aunts, uncles, grandparents, neighbors, teachers is to allow kids the space to play. Mm -hmm. Whatever that looks like in that play space, have no assessment or judgment around it. Just let it be. And look at it with wonder and curiosity. You know, my sister and I growing up with my grandmother, who I referenced early on, Odell, and we spent summers with her. We'd spend whole days, (laughs) whole summer East Texas days from the time we got out of bed, like being in character or like making a TV show or, you know, turning over a box and like, Figuring out like what that could be or, you know, I remember at one point turning over every dining room table in her formal, and when I say formal, she was, you know, a school teacher at one point in a one-room schoolhouse. So when I say formal, I'm using that in, you know, when there's no Buckingham Palace here, but, you know, her formal dining room, right, which was very precious to her, the space that she showed off and showcased in her humble home. We turned over every chair in the dining room and made a grocery store. Mm. And took out everything, every can in her cupboard, every ingredient. And she just let us do it. Yeah. Like she let us do it. One, that sends a message immediately to a child that play has value. Yes. Two, it sends a message that what you are doing is rich and full. And I'm going to step out of the way and let it unfold. And then she would pass through every now and then on the way to like go, I'm sure, clean the bathroom or do laundry and go, oh, that looks interesting. You know, oh, that looks interesting. And kind of make an observation. Mm. And of course, we had guide posts. Like we knew we had to like clean it up by a certain time and put it back the way it was. You know, it wasn't like she was there to be our stage crew. (laughs) (laughs) Imagination. But she let it unfold. Mm-hmm. So, and she was a teacher. And so maybe somewhere she being that she was a third grade teacher, she saw a kid's imagination and she had a chance to do that with her grandkids and she let it play out. So I had that lived experience. And then with my parents, one, they put us in after school programs all the time, mostly because they were working parents and they needed a place like it's 2.30. They <laughs> could not pick us up or see us or, you know, they were like, where are those kids going to go? Because we can't get to them until 6.30, you know, sometimes seven. So we had after school and then extended daycare beyond that. So we were always trying to be enriched with the ways in the times and spaces that they couldn't fill in. Mm. So they sought out creative outlets for us. And then the last thing that they did was when I came to them, and I think it was 18, 19, when I was like, yeah, I think I'm going to be an actress. They were like, okay, how can we help? Mm. And I have a lot of actor friends, artist friends, whose parents, the first thing their parents said was, how are you going to make a living? Or are you sure you want to do that? Maybe you should get a teaching degree first and then do that on the side. So the message there was there are all these caveats. Like you can kind of do that, but 
actually this other thing's more safe, secure, or the parents value it more, or sometimes parents very lovingly say, I don't know anybody in that business. How can I help you? Come do this because I know this. I have connections over here. I didn't hear any of that. All I heard was, how can I help you? Mm. And that gave a lot of space to explore and gave me a sense of a safety net. Now, we did also have practical conversations along the way, which was, okay, well, you know, to do this, you're also going to have to like, you know, have your own (laughs) partner. You know, so I had to figure those things out, which I think also helps artists Mm -hmm. to have to kind of hold the life part alongside how do you create a life as an artist? So that's, I think, a part of what was going on in my home was this commitment to play in our formative years. And then later, a sense that children have to follow their path and it's our job to support. Yeah. And I feel like all of those reminders are so accessible right now. Right now, we have so many limitations about what we can do, but to actually create space for play and to honor our kids and to just ask how we can help. Those are things we can do, even with all that's happening right now. Absolutely. What can come from the imagination? I mean, listen, the device we're recording on right now is the iPhone (laughs) or the computer. I mean, all of this was dream. I mean, Silicon Valley is a place where people are just dreaming up ideas. Like you got to make the space for the ideas, right? And so I was thinking just yesterday, oh, what can I do for my daughter Zoella? I was like, oh, you know what? There's a corner of the backyard. I'm going to put a table. I'm going to put an umbrella out there, set up some paints and have that be her corner of this domestic space, this quarantine space. But that is her corner that she can go do whatever the heck she wants to do in it. And all I can do is set up and provide it with some tools and then get out of the way. Yeah. So and good. Who knows? And not because, not with the end result that she will be a painter. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like some people are very sort of literal and utilitarian in that approach. Like, oh, <laughs> it's simply for the joy of it. Because yeah. what I want to have learned in life is that no matter what we choose to do in life, no matter what path we set ourselves on professionally or otherwise, we are going to have to know how to be with ourselves, how to tune into our deepest desires, how to clear the noise. And one of the best ways to do that is art. I mean, people crochet, people do puzzles, people do all kinds of things, but you're going to have to find a way to have a quiet space to be introspective. And I painted as a kid, not because I thought I was a great painter or would be a painter, but because it was a way for me to tune in. Yeah. So before we leave this guidepost, I invested in yourself. Share just a couple of things that you're tapping into to nurture yourself, to create space for your creativity, to tune into yourself. What are you doing these days? Yeah, in quarantine world, quarantine landia, (laughs) (laughs) in this space, what I'm doing, you know, right now is I have not had a meditation practice really ever in a consistent way. And even what I'm doing now, I hesitate to call it a formal meditation because it just seems so high and lofty and like well beyond what I'm doing. But effectively, what I'm doing is giving myself 10 minutes of slowed down space and quiet in the beginning of the day and then again at the end of my day, which is something I was not doing before the Mm. morning. I also am saying within this space, home, being home, carving out when I just need to be alone. Alone inside of a home with other people. (laughs) You know, and that's a way I'm taking care of myself because Prior to this, I went to work or I could take a drive or I could go to the beach. I could do things outside of the home to have time with myself. Well, now I'm deprived of the ability to go do those things out in the world to be with myself. So I have to be with myself in my own home with other people who the television's going, the dishwasher's going. There's a lot of ambient activity, sound, noise. And so for me as a creative person, to be able to scrub two thoughts together in my mind Mm -hmm. (laughs) or not think I need to carve out and have a sort of sanctuary space. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes that is what other people are doing this as well. You just go in a bedroom and shut the door and say, I'm not here. (laughs) I'm here, (laughs) but I'm not here. (laughs) Act as if. (laughs) There's so many times I wish I, you know, had like 
swiped from the mini hotels that I stayed in during my book tour, you know, the, like the do not disturb signs. Oh, on yes. the oh my God. I would like, if somebody <laughs> threw up, like I would just love a collection of those or just wear one around my neck some days. Like, just I walk through the house? Don't disturb right now. I'm in thought, but I just think it's important. The only way I know how to take care of can be the creative person, the scared person, the child inside of her, me right now that's going through all this is to say, I have to take care of me. And that looks like being quiet right now. Mm -hmm. Mm. I'm thinking about my wheels are already turning about my own, like what would be my sanctuary in my home? And I do have a morning practice and I've been going there more often on my deck outside my bedroom. And for Mother's Day, my husband and the boys replanted the pots there with flowers. There had been, you know, things dying <laughs> in them before. And so I'm just noticing how like already I'm starting to kind of beautify and really make sacred that space. But I love the idea of thinking of it actually as a sanctuary for myself. Yeah, right now. yeah. you know, without all the lofty sometimes things that has to be personal, you know, in pursuit of perfection we end up not doing things. So like when I hear sanctuary, I'm like, oh my God, it has to be gorgeous and beautiful. And my sanctuary sometimes is my bedroom with the laundry that I haven't folded yet, but right. it's quiet, <laughs> you know, and it's a place where I can close the door. And for the moment, the sanctuary is really deep inside. That's the sanctuary I'm trying to get to, Ooh, right? Sanctuary, sanctuary deep, inside. deep inside. That's yes. really what I'm trying to get yes. to. And not having to respond to external stimuli in a moment. I mean, I literally was thinking the other day, if I right now had my druthers and could go on like a three-day silence retreat, I totally would. But I can't, you know, and not that I did that before, but suddenly I'm like craving them. Like what would You're silence to that now? Yeah. yeah. And mostly I think it's simply because I'm trying to get to that place inside and I don't have to go anywhere to do it and I can't. So I'm going to find it inside. Mm. Well, we have arrived at the last guidepost C, which stands for connected to a strong support network so that we remember that when we're on the journey that we don't have to do it alone, we can be in community. And you've already touched on this in some ways, but just wondering if there's anything else that comes up for you about how you have created community and sisterhood and support as you have answered the call many times in your life. Oh, thank you for that question. Yes, I've had to build many different communities over my life, over the course of, we haven't talked a lot about the book, but for those who have read it or those who have not, the book is also centered around the caregiving that I did of my husband, my late husband, when he was ill and I was a cancer caregiver. And during that time, I had to build a caregiving network for myself, right? My friends who didn't know that experience they couldn't always help me in ways that I needed. At different times, I've had to build an acting community network, a mothering of mothers. And so right now, I have a group of parents, mom friends that I go to, right? Our kids are similar age, go to school together and kind of we check in. I have my like people who do the deep spiritual stuff with me. I've got that group of folks. I've got people that I can talk to about craft and the creative bit. but. What I know is that each day I need to reach out to somebody in one of those circles. Mm. And then within those circles, I have, there are people that I do sort of quick, short, terse text with. And then I have a couple people in my life that I can send them like a long, fully exposed, vulnerable, I'm full of all the feelings text. <laughs> and they'll take it in and respond. Yeah. And I think everybody should have one or two of those people in your pocket, if you, in your back pocket, if you can. People who will listen to your heart and mind processing. Yeah. Beautiful. I know that I could talk to you for a lot longer. <laughs> I have so many questions. We're getting close to the end of our time. So I want to invite you now to give me a challenge, something that I could say yes to that could deepen my journey and more fully living my epic life. And as always, anybody who's listening can say yes to this challenge for themselves. Thank you, first of all, for asking me that of me because it's a generous question and whatever I'm going to say is going to be something I'm seeking to do for myself. So it's a really good way to be in community 
around these ways that we want to grow and stretch in life. And so I've been thinking about, and people ask me often about resilience because it's one of the themes of my book. And it's something that I know as someone who was widowed and a kid caregiver. And what does resilience look like? And I think the thing I'd like to say is, would we, I guess the call to action or the invitation would be each day to be willing to slow down enough and be with that sanctuary within in such a way that whatever you discover there feels restorative, feels full, and that then you are willing to take it outside of you and share it with the world. And I say that because it's coming to me now that those of us who are well, who have shelter, who have food, who are not diseased or diseased, those of us who are in that place, we are called upon to be the helpers right now in society, but we can't quite fully do that if we're not rested. And the only way I know to get rest is to go into the quiet place inside. And if I don't do that, I can't give anything outwardly. I think that's what I'd like to call forth and to invite us all to do is to be with ourselves with the idea of not just what it's going to give us, but how being with ourselves can actually serve the greater good. Yes. Ooh, okay. I enthusiastically say yes to that challenge (laughs) and a connection that I'm feeling between that and the work that you do in the world is that I know that I'm a writer and I'm not always writing or sharing that. And recently I started coming back to this idea of morning pages. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Very much, very much. Um, So so I'm going to seek ways to find that quiet. And one of the ways is to commit more fully to doing some writing every day. So thank you for that inspiration. I love that. And I will continue to do what you've been doing. You've inspired me, which is to have my morning time, continue that practice and see what emerges there. Beautiful. At the end of every conversation, We each have a chance to close out with acknowledgements or takeaways. It's just reflections or things that we maybe have more insight or clarity about than we did when we started the conversation. I will go first, but before I do that, I had this one curiosity that I didn't get to ask you about. So I'm going to mention what it was that I saw in the book. And then when you share your acknowledgements, if there's anything you might say about this to weave in, I would love to hear. I was so struck by the Sicilian proverb at the beginning of part four or the third summer chapter in your beautiful book. It said, hunger is the best sauce. And it just kind of leapt out on the page to me. So when I pass it off to you to close, if there's anything that's feeling present or connected about that proverb to what we've been discussing, I'd love to hear what comes up for you. Well, I think the fact that a part of the Mother's Quest podcast and the epic journey work is all about following a desire and really following it fully and with intention and through whatever you may discover along the way, things you kind of imagined might happen, but a lot of things maybe you didn't imagine would happen. Yeah. And really being with that and then kind of having some guideposts. Like I love that you've kind of drilled it down to these guideposts that make for the epic life and how that relates to the proverb is hunger is the best sauce, meaning it's from that place of that deep desire that gets you up to go make the sauce in the kitchen. (laughs) I mean, literally, quite frankly, the hunger is in and of itself is its own reward. And so, but you need to be able to be in tune with the hunger because hunger can feel a lot of different ways. It can feel restless. It can feel like frustration. It can feel like a lot of different things. But if you slow down with it, there's something that in there that's seeking to be lived. And so that can become something beautiful. And I think that's the journey I learned through writing my book, was that the desire, the hunger to share the story has become this beautiful sauce that I've made. <laughs> you know, that I get to like chat with you and People want to even hear what I think or say, or the fact that I get to say my great grandmother's name out in the world, that only is happening right now in this moment because I followed the hunger. 
Right. Oh, that's so beautiful. And of course, the extension of that to thinking about like the guidepost as the ingredients, you know, this amazing sauce that is my life. Mm -hmm. I love all the metaphors that this evokes. So I want to say that some of the gifts that I'm leaving this conversation with are a reminder about the power of creating space to help our children step into the fullest expression of who they are meant to be for ourselves, the incredible anchoring that can be found when we reconnect to our ancestors and the stories and the seeds that they've planted for us, to look up to the sky, to remember to have faith in even what we can't see in terms of the next steps ahead of us. And then finally, about the importance of finding that quiet space within that sanctuary. So I am leaving with all of those gifts from this conversation. Thank you. What is coming into sharper focus for you as we close? Just the reminder of the power of sharing each of our experiences and sitting down and talking. You know, we can each be each other's guide. And we can look to guides. And so I like that you ask this at the end, the both, you know, sort of in real time reflection, but also I look forward to the reflections that will come to me later in the afternoon, tomorrow, a week from now, a year from now, a decade from now. And that only, you know, happens because we make space to sit and talk and share each other's experiences. So I love that. Yes. Uh, What a gift this was. What a gift your creative pursuits are. Wow, we didn't even talk about Never Have I Ever. <laughs> Which I so yeah, oh my. I've been enjoying. It's a fantastic show. I love that show. I can have a whole podcast on that show. We might need to do a part two. Yeah. I think that the other final thought I would have is that during this time, this, is a, this conversation is a reminder to be mindful about the I part of Epic, which is the care of oneself again, goes back to if we don't care for ourselves, we sort of can't be of service in the world. So, Mm. All right. I'm so committed to that and the other invitation that you've given me and just thrilled to be able to share this special conversation with the Mother's Quest community. Thank you, Tembi. I look forward to continuing to walk alongside you and to learn from you. Julie, thank you so very much. I'm honored to be here. Thank you for your thoughtful and beautiful and expansive question. It's been a really lovely time chatting with you. Thank you so much for coming along with me on this episode of the Mother's Quest podcast. I hope this conversation sparked something that will help you live your epic life. If you'd like to get show notes and learn more about how to join the Mother's Quest community, visit mothersquest.com. And while you're there, I would love it if you would follow the prompts to subscribe, leave a review on Apple Podcasts, and help us to spread the word. I want to end with some words to help light the way on your quest. Seize the day. Love your people. Honor your gifts. Until next time.